Praise the Lord. Now you know where I get my singing voice. I'm so blessed that my dad is still here at 87. It'll be 88 in August. And uh, it's like uh, Mitch Key's son told him here a few years back when he was talking about being old in his 70s. He said, well, Moses didn't get started till he was 80. So that's right. Praise God. I mean, I'm going to have to wait that long for my inheritance. I better watch it. I'm going to get in trouble this morning. Hey, let's just stand up for another minute. I know you're comfy and all that, but just stretch out one more time. Praise God. Lord, thank you. As we prayed earlier, Lord, we know that we need your help. And Holy Spirit, we give you absolute dominion and control over our minds, our hearts, our bodies. We yield to you today. We come to sit like Mary of old. We come to sit at Jesus' feet to receive that part which will not be taken from us. Lord, impart, pour into us today that which we need to hear and know from you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, find a dad and tell him Happy Father's Day before you're seated. Praise the Lord again to you. Okay. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Same to you, or not same to you. <laughs> same to my dad. <laughs> yeah, same to your dad. Tell him for me. Do we have uh, do we have any of those little pen knives left over or did we give them all out? Well, if we didn't, we'll put them up there on the thing there by the sound booth uh, shelf. And if you, uh, if you know a dad, you're going to see him this afternoon or something. And by the way, we won't be having service tonight because people do go and celebrate with their families. So we won't be having service tonight. As Karen mentioned, the kids are coming home from camp this morning. They're supposed to leave around 10 o'clock. It's about a two-hour drive uh, back down here. So uh, we'll inform you if we hear from them before service is over. Praise God. Well, grab your Bible or pick it up. You don't have to grab it. Just... Pick it up if you want to. And turn with me over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I, I'm normally not a, a person who just because we're on a certain holiday or whatever that I try to speak on that holiday. I like to ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to talk about. And uh, the thing about doing that is a lot of times he doesn't let you in on it until you get to it. And... Uh, just to be on, that's right, you don't want me messing it up, that's for sure. We don't need to hear from me, we want to hear from him. And that's kind of the way this has been. There's been some things that have, Genesis chapter 3, there's been some things that, thoughts that have been in my mind, I believe, come from him, but uh, sometimes it's kind of like a tornado in there. You ever feel like there's a tornado in your head? They just don't have, they aren't put together, but we're trusting him to put them all together, Amen. But I want to talk to you uh, about the Father's voice. Everybody say the Father's voice. You know, the devil does not want you to look at God as your Father. Now, God is more than just a Father. There's no doubt about that. The Bible calls him the judge. The Bible calls him a king. Uh, he has, I forget how many names <laughs> uh, that uh, describe him, and each name is a description of another person part of who he is and how he is. And so he's not just a father, but uh, his intention with us as his children is to be a father first and foremost. First and foremost. And you see that here in, in Genesis. Even after Adam and Eve had sinned, over here in chapter 3, it says in verse 8, it says, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the voice of of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Isn't it interesting how that sin will cause you to try to hide yourself from God's presence? When people, you know, get caught up, maybe they're struggling with a drug habit or some kind of thing in their life, and they fall back into it, they stop going to church. 
They don't want to get around God, you know, and that's the exact opposite of what you should do. And, of course, over the years, the church has kind of helped the devil in that area by condemning everybody that's struggling with something. Amen. I can remember old-time Pentecostals, you know, somebody would come to the altar and get saved. And uh, if they weren't just this mature Christian by Tuesday, everybody was, well, I knew they didn't get anything. Well, you need to let God rewind the tape for you a few years. Back to when you first got saved. You weren't exactly the uh, shining example of holiness yourself. Amen? So, when, when, you miss, when you struggle with things, don't run from God. Run to Him. He's the answer. He's the answer. Amen? It's one thing to be rebellious and, you know, going to do your own thing regardless of what God thinks. It's another thing to be wanting to follow after the Lord and sometimes just tripping over your own fleshly feet, which all of us have and do. Amen. Praise God. And I'm not making an excuse for sin. The Bible says a righteous person will fall seven times but rise again. The number seven means completion. What God's saying is, if you have a right heart with me and you just keep following me, you're going to fall, but there'll be one, a one point in time where in that area of your life, you'll trip and fall and get up and never fall there again. That's good news right there. Amen. Praise God. So anyway, I don't want to get off on that little rabbit trail and stay over there. It says, verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the Kulu today. The, the voice wasn't walking. God was walking. Amen. The Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, but they heard his voice, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now look, verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam. He called unto Adam. He called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? Where are you? What was God wanting? He was wanting to fellowship. He was wanting to hang out with Adam. He was wanting to be with Adam and Eve. You know why it's quiet? Because sometimes the devil paints a picture in our mind or we do it ourselves or some religious person does it for us that God really, you know, God hangs around us because he has to, not because he wants to. Come on, are you here? But I got news for you. God loves you. His love for you is greater than any failure, shortcoming. Go down the list. His love trumps all of that. Now, he's made us a free moral agent, so we make choices. And when we make those choices, even though he doesn't agree with that or want uh, that to happen, he has to allow us to go our own way. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I've studied the Word for years. I, I know a little bit about walking with God and so forth. Uh, but I could choose right now to go out here and go try to rob a bank. Probably be a good idea if I waited until they opened up on Monday. But <laughs> Some criminals are about that smart, you know. Amen? He doesn't violate our free will. But he loves us as children. He created us because he has a father's heart. Yeah. He wants to have a family. Yeah. He wanted to have a family. That's why he created a family. Amen. And here he is calling out to them, where are you? I want to be with you. Yes. Yes. See, we've had much distortion in our day and hour coming through the media and other ways about the role of a father. Some people try to elevate themselves by devaluing somebody else. Now, I realize that there have been problems, you know, um, sexism and things like that, where, you know, if you study history, women have been treated wrong. And, and if you, a lot of even things today, religions today, women are treated uh, about the same level as a, an animal in some things and all that. But we don't fix that by putting down a man and making a woman higher than a man. These two people were created. Eve came out of Adam's 
it says a rib, but if you look it up in the original language, it means God took a side of Adam and created a woman. And that's why in, in marriage there's that completeness when you let God put a, make it more than just a piece of paper and a contract and two people trying not to kill each other. Like one person said, you know, they asked, have you ever thought about divorce? They said, no, murder, yes, but divorce, no. <laughs> but marriage, it, when you let the Holy Spirit in your marriage covenant, it becomes something where he puts you back together and there's a wholeness. There's a wholeness that happens. And I know it takes two people and, and all of that. I know all of that stuff about it. But the point is, is that God created man and woman to be partners together. But the problem today is that the roles of those two are being confused. A father cannot be a mother and a mother cannot be a father. Lord, help me stay on track here. Your track. Amen. And so a lot of the, the modern feminism teaching has gone too far. By putting men down, they think they're lifting themselves up. And really, that's not what it's going to be. Because I'm going to tell you something, there's nothing worse than trying to be something you're not. Yeah. Amen. There's nothing worse than trying to be something you're not. And thank God for mothers and fathers. We need both of them. Without them, we wouldn't be here, number one. And there are things that you know, come, came through my mother and things that I see my wife as a mother doing... I mean, just childbirth itself. I sat over there in the corner going, oh, my God, am I glad I'm not a woman. <laughs> Come on, how many of you men, you know? You, woo! Thank you, Jesus. Bunch of wimps, yeah. Praise God. So, so there's this, this balance, this understanding. Amen of honoring one another and that kind of thing. But back to what we're talking about with God. God says, where are you? He wanted them to come and to fellowship with him. He wanted them to hear his father's voice. Amen? Now turn over to the uh, John's, or excuse me, is it John? Yeah, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Thank you, Father. John chapter 1. What I'm sharing with you today, when I begin to understand this in my Christian life, and I'd been a Christian many years, but my perception of God was always the high ruling potentate king up on a throne and angry at sin, therefore angry at me. Come on. And to be honest, I got saved because I was scared. Do you ever get scared? I got scared of hell. I was scared to not be a Christian. And the Bible says some save with fear, jerking their feet out of the fire. Maybe I was just one of those knotheads that you had to get, I had to get saved with fear. And, but the problem was, as long as I understood that, and I'm not blaming anybody. I mean, sometimes a lot of the teaching and preaching back in those days, there was more emphasis on on uh, sin than there was on righteousness. And they didn't have to tell me I was messed up. I knew that when I walked in the church door. Amen? You ever go to church, you felt pretty good when you got there, and by the time you left, you felt like you'd been beat up by somebody, you know, that had been wanting to work out on your face? Sometimes that's how I felt. And there again, it may have just been me. It probably wasn't. We, we got to... We gotta, Stay in the middle of the road with who God is. Amen? Paul says, knowing the goodness and the severity of God. Amen. But he's a fair God. He's a good God. Praise God. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I got saved because of that, but I, I had a hard time being a Christian because I was afraid of God. I was like Adam here. I was his son. But I was afraid of him. I was embarrassed because I wasn't as perfect as he was and as, uh, you know, pure as he was as I read the Bible. Right. I felt guilt. I felt condemnation. I, uh, you know, I, I'd go out and, you know, I was a kid and I'd 
you know, do kid stuff. And then, of course, the enemy's right there to tell you how imperfect you are if you don't already know it. Amen. And then I'd read scriptures like, be ye holy as I am holy. And then the one there, you've, you've heard me talk about it before, the one where Abraham, he, God spoke to Abraham and says, walk before me and be perfect. And I thought, well, that's, that's it for me. I'm done. But I found out that word perfect in the original Hebrew means, means sincere. It's about your heart. It's not about your humanity and the, the mistakes you make. Now, there again, understand, I'm not saying you just go do whatever you want to do, and God's just this big, ignorant teddy bear in the sky that overlooks everything about everybody. He does not. He does not. He, and he is a righteous judge. And those that make him their enemy, they will face him as king one day and judge. Because he's going to keep the devil's kingdom out of his kingdom. Amen. And that's the truth. Oh, I'm so tempted to get off on a rabbit trail right now. But I better, better stay here. John chapter 1. In the beginning, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Notice He calls the Word a Him. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But now here's what I, the verse I was wanting to get to, verse 12. But as many as received him, to him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. If you're born again in here, if you've received Jesus, say, I'm a son of God. The sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Actually, this word sons in the original Greek means children. God has sons and daughters. I mean, in one sense of the word, they're all sons, but he has sons and daughters. Children of God. Now look what it says, verse 12, to as many as received him. See, how do you get, how do you get in God's family? You have to receive Jesus into your life. What does that mean? That means you open up the door of your heart and you say, Lord, I need you. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I need someone to save me from my, my sin nature. I need to be out of the devil's kingdom and out of his family and into your kingdom and into your family. Jesus looked at the religious people of that day, a bunch of them, and he said, you are of your father, the devil. There are people whose spiritual father is the devil. Because they have the same nature spiritually he has. And we all had that before we received Christ. Over in Mark chapter 16 where it talks about the, the Great Commission. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And those that believe that, that what you preach and are baptized will be saved. Those that don't will be damned. And you look up the word damned in the original Greek, and it means left in their present condition. Their condition is separated from God. If you've never opened your heart and, to, and admitted, been humble enough to admit you need Jesus as your Savior and invited Him to come in and to give Him your life to cause you to be born from above or born by the Spirit of God, born again is another way of saying it, then you are on your way to hell. Not because God's mad at you and he's going to crumple you up and throw you there someday. It's because that's your home. That's your father. You're in his kingdom. And when you die physically on this earth, then your spirit man, the real you living in that tent I'm looking at today, will go home to be with whoever your God is. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the truth. People don't like to hear that truth today. 
They want to say things like, we're all the children of God. No. We've all been created by God. But the scriptures make a very distinct separation. All religions serve the same God. No, they don't. If that's true, I've got to throw my Bible away. It's lying to me. Jesus said, you know, people say, oh, there's many pathways to God. Well, there may be many pathways to God, but there's only one door into the kingdom. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by and through me. He said, I am the door to the sheepfold. That's why he's so controversial. That's why people who have that demonic spirit in them hate you and me. Because the spirit that's in them despises the spirit that's working in us. We're not better than them. We didn't, you know, we're not so much superior and earn, earn something or somehow with our uh, own human works attain something. We just discovered one day we were in trouble and we had enough sense to ask God to get us out of trouble. Come on, are you here? Amen. Praise God. You know, I don't argue with people. If they want to debate all of that, I just tell them, you know, it's obvious you've never met Jesus. What do you mean met him? And they want to argue about the book, you know, or something else. The book won't mean anything to you until you meet him. Because, see, this book was authored by him through the Holy Spirit. And until you meet him and know him, he's, he's got to teach you the book. Are you here? Amen. Praise God. So Jesus is our Lord and Savior because of his goodness. And it's, it was through him here in verse 12, it says, that we were given the power to become the children of God. Well, you mean to tell me, Pastor, all those people out there that believe something else, that God's just going to uh, just turn his back on them and let them all go to hell? No. That's why he sent us here. That's why he put the light of the world in us. See, the scriptures say over in Romans 1, there will be no human being that's ever lived on the face of the earth that will be able to stand on judgment day before the, the throne of God and have an excuse. Because it says there in Romans 1, even the very creation is telling us that he exists. And finally, met, uh, finally science is even starting to figure it out. There's been some amazing discoveries in science uh, in the last several years that even people who have been lifelong atheists and have, you know, uh, just gone that whole no God route are starting to admit there has to be a designer of all of this. That it couldn't just happen because something went boom one day. I do believe in the Big Bang. God spoke and it went kaboom. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So we're living in a day and an hour. God's not, you know, turning his back on people. And see, a lot of people that want to, want to do that, that routine there, they really don't want to know God. They really don't. It's hard to believe, but there are people that really don't want to know him. See, the Bible says, Jesus himself said it. Those that seek, I will enable them to find. So if you're really sincere in your heart that, you know, if there is a God and if he is this benevolent, loving God and he did create me and create this place and there's really a way to walk with him for eternity in his kingdom, I'm going to seek that and find, I'm going to be serious enough to at least find out if that's true or not. If you don't have that kind of heart, you'll never find him. And you can't blame him because you have a heart. Everybody knows when they don't have Jesus in them that they haven't got it all yet. Something's wrong. There's a void. There's an emptiness. I haven't, uh, there's, uh, there's something not complete here. Come on. I mean, we even feel that way as Christians sometimes. You know, when somehow our, our relationship gets out of whack a little bit or, or, you know, certain things. God's wanting to teach us something and... You know, he, he just allows us to feel that, you know, wait a minute, there's something else here. I need to seek the Lord. The Bible says if you'll seek him, you'll find him. Yeah. Don't ever quit seeking God. Yeah. He's got more to show you, more to teach you, more to bless you with, more to reveal to you. He's your father. Yeah. Now, if you study the role of father, 
in the Bible, you'll find that a father, primarily a father's position is that of teacher. Everybody say teacher. He's responsible to be a leader teacher in his family. Now that doesn't mean his wife can't teach. Matter of fact, wives and mothers teach and they, they have their own flow and move and uh, of doing that and so forth and so on. As a matter of fact, I've had my wife teach me a few things. Come on, thank you, Jesus. Thank God. I'm willing to hear from anyone. I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to be a pride-filled fool. My head's already big enough. I have to wear a big enough hat on this head. I don't want it any bigger than it is. Can you say amen? Amen. I want to know the truth. I don't want to walk around spouting off a bunch of ignorance because I'm full of pride. The Bible says that pride is a blinder. It's really a false light. It's really a false light. And the Bible says that if you stay in pride long enough, you're going to fall off a cliff. So humility. Humility is not becoming a rug so God can just walk over the top of you. Humility, actually that word means in the Greek, to find your place under his headship, under his authority as your father, your shepherd, your God, your Lord, your king. And you better be glad he is and you're not. Because we weren't created to be gods and when we try to do what Adam and Eve did and play God, it doesn't work. Moving right along since that went over real big. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm having fun today. I don't care whether you are or not. Come on, this is fun. I do care. But it is what it is. Let the chips fall where they may. Amen? We need to hear some things sometimes. So God is a father. He loves us. He gave us the ability to become his sons and his daughters, his children. Hallelujah. Now, a father... You know, like I got married at the ripe old age of 19 years old. Come on. Karen was 18. She's 10 months younger than I am. So uh, every time I have a birthday, I say to her, yeah, I remember when I was that age. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, you know, we had Mike and Mark, when was Mike born? How old was I? About 20. We were married in 71. He was born in 74. Do you ever want to know dates, times, whatever you did wrong? Just ask your wife. <laughs> Amen. So I, I was in my, mid, I, I, you know, I mean, it was like, I'm holding Mike in my hands and I'm like, Oh, my God, what have I done here? I mean, maybe not even those exact words, but you know what I'm saying? The, uh, just, there was a point in time where the responsibility of... Uh, of uh, there's a life here that I'm in charge of seeing to it that this child grows upright. Now, that may not be a big deal to you, but it was to me. And I just, I felt so inadequate at times. And even as I look back now, I'm 65 years old, and I look back and I go, oh, God, what did I say that for? What did I do that for? I should have done this, and should have, could have, would have. I don't think there's anybody that's ever, quote, raised their kids perfect or done everything right. Aren't you glad we don't have to do everything right? God makes up for our, our ignorance and even our willful wrongs at times. Come on, are you here? Amen? And so, you know, that that role of father-teacher, I understood, and I think many times that's what causes men to kind of check out because they they feel that knowing or they have that witness, I guess I could say, in in, in their heart that this is who I'm to be, and they don't know how to do that, or maybe they didn't have a dad that taught them anything about that, and so it's real easy to just, you know, I found out something about men. When they get confronted with a situation, uh, you know, a threat or an insurmountable situation, they do one of two things. They either beat it up or run from it. They either conquer it or they turn and walk away from it somehow. And God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to understand that he knows we don't know what we're doing. But he knows what he's doing. And if we'll be humble enough to come to him and say, God... 
You are the father of all fathers. And so I need your wisdom as a father to train, to teach, to raise my children up so that they have a right perspective spiritually, naturally, every other way, and that they can walk in this life in your wisdom and follow you and have the blessing that you've intended for them. Amen. 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 And God will help you. Every father in here or anybody that will be a father or anybody that will be a spiritual father, you are anointed to be a father. I don't care if your sons are my son's age. They're still, and even though it's more talking to God about them than talking to them about God, there comes that day, and it's not that my sons and I have this bad relationship or something. We don't. But even at their age, there's times where I can see, well, who? Hope they don't go that way. <laughs> and I, you know, and, and you can let the devil turn it into this, and I have at times, let it become a tormenting thing. Oh, what if this happens? What if they do that? And what about the grandchildren and all that? Anybody been there? Yes, you have. Don't lie. Lift your hand. But God knows how. And, and here's the great thing about it. This is another thing. Any office God sets you in and anoints you, he gives you the power and the ability to respond through his anointing to any situation. He never leaves you hanging. He never leaves you without what you need. Now, he may not give you every fact that you want to hear from him about it, but if you step up and step in and receive who you are as a father and know that you're anointed to be a father and that you have, now listen to this, father's authority. I have the right to protect my seed, my children in the spirit. I have the right to tell the devil, take your hands off. People don't do that enough in the body of Christ. We've been deceived into trying to get God to do the cross again. Yeah. Oh, God, help. Do something about it. He, I already did. I broke the devil's power over your life and their life. The cross was enough. Jesus, uh, Jesus went through the cross and is seated on the throne. So a lot of people have Jesus still hanging on the cross. Now, we always need to be mindful of the cross. We always need to understand it's the blood that was shed there. It was the life of God that was released at the cross. In his brokenness, our wholeness came. Amen? At the cross. But he didn't stay on the cross. He went up and is seated on the throne of glory, ruling and reigning over all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that's named. He rose from the dead and told his disciples, all authority, all right and might, uh, in heaven and in earth is mine now. And guess what? I'm giving it to you. Now you go. You go and do this. You go and do that. Amen? Hallelujah. When you see the devil messing with your kids, well, how do I know it's the devil? Are they acting like the devil? Are they talking like the devil? Are they thinking like the devil? Well, I don't know. Well, study the Bible so you know who the devil is. The Bible says we're not to be ignorant of his devices. See, this book is the owner's manual to life, and we don't have time to read it. Some of you, your car, you wouldn't even think about working on that car without digging into the owner's manual to make sure you're not going to mess something up. But yet, I don't have time to talk to God. I don't have time to let my Father teach me and counsel me. I don't have time to read the Word. I don't have time to pray and fellowship with God. I don't have time to cultivate my spiritual life with God. And then we wonder why we go out and try to fix life and we break it. Yeah. <laughs> Smile at me now and then so I know you're, the rocks are still on the floor. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm, really, I'm a nice person, really. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. Well, maybe, don't ask her. Just ask me, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah, ask one of the kids, huh? Praise God. But it's, it's so true, folks. It's so true. God will show you. You know, and sometimes he'll tell you, just shut up and pray. Sometimes we, you know, we want to jump in there and fix it. You're not the fixer. 
I, I remember one time my son, Mike, was getting all stewed up about something and stirred up and so I could see, you know, the, the enemy's going to harass him about this. So I was just praying for him. Lord, I ask you to give him peace or help him. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, tell Mike it's his job to train his children and it's my job to promote them. Doesn't the Bible tell us? Father's mother, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, when he becomes mature, he'll not depart from that. He'll wake up one day and realize, you know what? Dad did know what he was talking about. Mom did know what they were talking about. And then if we train them right, they'll develop that relationship with God themselves. And that the, the father can teach them to be a father or a mother. You say, oh, I, I need that in my life. I didn't have that with my parents. Today's a new day. You can start today. You can move forward today. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Hallelujah. The... Uh, The scriptures tell us as parents to raise our children <clears throat> in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That's something else that's gotten messed up in our society these days. Admonition, nurture. We don't want nurture. Nurture is encouragement. Nurture is hugs. Nurture is saying, hey, don't let the devil beat you up over this. It's going to be all right. You're going to come out of this and you can make it. And it's true. Because with God, you can't ever not make it. All things are possible to those that believe what? That all things are possible with God. You've always got a bright future. If you're a Christian, you've always got a bright future. The Bible says in Paul's writings, godliness, what does that mean? That means walking with God, listening to God, letting God be who he needs to be in your life. Godliness is profitable. Now, for those of you that are wanting to make a profit, here you go. Godliness is profitable, it says, having the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come in eternity. Oh, it's hard to be a Christian. Oh, no, it's not. It's profitable. The way of the transgressor is hard. Sin has pleasure for a season. You think it's hard being a Christian because you've got to discipline your flesh a little bit and tell yourself no and keep going when you don't want to go and all that kind of thing. Amen. And get in the tape ministry, put duct tape over your mouth so you don't say things. Now people don't even know what tapes are nowadays. That's, that's ancient history now. Ask Karen about it after the service. She'll tell you about it. That's, but we, we think that's hard. That's not hard. Let me tell you what's hard. Having the devil dominate your life and destroy, kill, steal, and destroy in your family. That's what's hard. That's what's hard. So don't buy that nonsense from the enemy. And don't give me that nonsense either. It's hard being a... No, it ain't. <laughs> not compared to what's waiting for you on the other, other side of the mountain there, it's not. Come on. Hello? So the Bible tells us as fathers and as mothers, raise your children up in the nurture and the admonition. That's the balance, see. Nowadays it's, oh no, don't tell Johnny no. Matter of fact, ask him what he is sexually. Are you a boy or a girl? Look down your drawers, you can figure it out. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Well, you're just making fun of people that are... No, I'm not. Those people aren't going to get help until we quit confirming and affirming their confusion. That's one of the manifestations. Read it in Romans 1. It's one of the manifestations of the spirit of confusion. And God is not the author of confusion, so guess who is? I'm not against those people. I love them. I love them enough to tell them the truth. You Christians, you just hate people. You're just condemning them to hell. I'm not condemning them to hell. I'm trying to help them stay out of hell. Yeah. 
Amen. And, I, and I'm not, you know, I'm not rude to people. I don't get in people's faces and all that kind of thing. But the truth is the truth. Well, I, I want my child to grow up and just be who he is. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Not who he is when he's that little, pulling all the stuff out of the cabinets, you know, choking the cat to death and that kind of thing. There again, the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the spirit of a child. Why? He's born with sin. He's born, he, he, he's not conscious of sin yet. He doesn't understand that yet, so God doesn't hold him accountable for it yet. But that very nature that's in him, did you, did you find out? I mean, they didn't even have to be two years old before they're punching some other kid in the nose in nur the nursery and taking their toy away from him. Mine! Mine! No! On a, on a childhood scale, that's rebellion. That's foolishness. Well, are you holding that little child? No, I'm not. I know he doesn't know what's going on. But if you take the position as a father and a mother, oh, who are you? What do you want to do? Kid says, I want to eat all the candy in Madeira today. Let's go. I want 14 ice creams. When you try to make me go to bed when I, I don't want to go to bed, I want to be able to hit you and punch on you and have you go, don't do that. No. Time out. <laughs> oh, boy, am I getting in trouble today. But somebody's got to do this. We had a, a better balance of this in society back in like the 50s and six, early 60s, and then we started to rebel against it in the 60s. Right. Yep. And all the talk today about not bullying people, being nice to people, I'm all for that, believe me. Yeah. I'm not against that. But why do we have, instead of kids punching each other a little bit in high school, them shooting each other? Yeah. If we've done such a great job allowing them to be who they are. We haven't helped them. We haven't drawn the line for them. We haven't nurtured and admonished them and kept them in a safe place where they understand their love, but there are boundaries, and if you go outside those boundaries, the devil is going to destroy you and your life and maybe others. I wish the devil wasn't in this earth. I wish that maniacal, perverse spirit wasn't here influencing people, but he is. And I have to be aware of him every day. I have to watch and pray. I have to be on alert every day because he'll subtly, subtly come and start planting thoughts in my mind to try to pull me away from what's right so he can access my life and bring killing, stealing, and destroying into my life. And my mom and dad told me the truth. And if they, I didn't listen to the truth, they administered the truth to me. They applied the Board of Education to the seat of learning, yes. Well, that's child abuse. No, it isn't. I'm, I'm not talking about beating bruises on somebody or, or hurting somebody in that way. I'm talking about teaching a person that rebellion produces pain in your life. And, you know, they've even, psychologists have proved, Lord, I'm way off out over here somewhere. I don't even know where we're at. They've, psychologists have proved that when a little two, three-year-old's throwing a fit in the floor, you know what they're saying? They're not saying, you're not treating me right as a parent. They're saying, where are the boundaries? I don't feel secure here. Years ago, they built a, a new uh, elementary school, and they were, they were testing some of this stuff. And so they purposely left the fence around the school out for a few days. And then they just let the kids go out and play like they would in recess. And they observed and the kids would group up in small groups, just kind of stand around together. Maybe they'd play jacks or whatever it was they were doing back in those days. And, uh, you know, that they wouldn't get out and, and start running across the, the playground. So they built the fence and observed them. And they went out and started playing kickball and doing all the things kids, tetherball and all that kids started doing in those, back in those days. They felt free because they had a boundary. They felt secure. 
When people don't know where the boundaries are at, they feel insecure. Breeds the spirit of fear. And then when they find out that their parents should have laid a boundary out for them, they get mad at them and hate them. The very thing we're trying to accomplish by letting them do whatever they want is the exact opposite of what's going to happen. Well, that's my soapbox for the day. But as, as spiritual fathers, we need to teach our children the truth. They're not going to like it. I didn't like it either. I remember going to my bedroom and my dad would tell me the truth and the way it was and here's how it's going to be. And I'd... Rah, 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 rah. I thought he was just being mean to me, treating me bad, liked my brother better than me, or something like that. All the excuses we come up with when we know we're wrong and we are still just doing what we're doing. Amen? But the Lord is still truthful. Can I help you, brother? You need something? Are you okay? Okay. But the Lord, his word is still the truth. And as fathers, we need to be the example to our children. Now, we don't just need to be, you know, we're, I'm not talking about being a, an anointed drill sergeant. There are times we have to be stern, straightforward, here's the way it's going to be. But we also need to be those that can pick them up and love them and tell them it's going to be all right. Amen? Well, let me wind up with this here. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, look at verse 20. My son. Sounds like a father talking here, doesn't it? Because it is a father. Now listen to this. My son, attend to my words. Now I'm talking about now you and I being in the son position and him being in the father position. I'll never not need my father. I'll always appreciate my earthly father forever but I'll never not need my heavenly father to be a father to me. Because I'm not perfect yet. I'm not in the full image of Christ yet. I don't know it all. You missed a real good place to say amen right there. I expected at least my wife to say amen on that. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear unto my sayings. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear unto my sayings. That word attend there in the original Hebrew, it means, it's from a root word that means for like, an, like a dog or an animal to prick up their ears. You know, they, they hear something and they, they start really listening. What, what is that out there? Maybe they perceive a threat or the neighbor's cat's in my yard, I'm going to eat him for lunch or whatever it might be. Right? God says that's the way you need to be about him as father. See, you can just kind of lumber through life and just, you know, your mind's just like, oh, what do I think? And I mean, you know, what does the devil say? And, and so, so You can just live that way. You can live in your own soul and try to work your life out yourself. And the devil will deceive you if you do that. Amen. But if you have that kind of attitude, Father, I need you to be a father to me every day. If I'm going to be the father I need to be, I need you to be a father to me. And I need you, even if I'm not a father, I need you to be my father. And one way that works is if you decide, I am going to prick up my ears. I am going to listen for his voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And another, they'll not follow. So you need to choose every day. I'm going to listen. My father's going to speak to me today, and I'm going to listen to him. He's going to prompt me. He's going to give me a, a knowing, an understanding. He's going to show me what to do. And you know, the Bible says we have not because we ask not. We need to ask a lot more than we do. Not ask to get our way. Not say, I want to eat the 14 ice creams today. But to say, Father, what do you say about this? Father, what do I need to understand about this? You know, I've found in my life many times what I think is the problem has nothing to do with the problem. It's a fruit of the problem. You know, if you're in fear all the time, then there's a root to the fear. There's something that's feeding that fear consistently. You're not going to 
cut the fruit of fear off and say, got it done. Nope. It'll grow again. You've got to find out what the root is. And that's only going to come as God reveals to you because a root is under the surface. You can't see it with your natural observation. You have to go to God and say, show me what's the bottom line here. What's the root? And he will. He will. There's been times when I've went to the Lord and, you know, what about that? He said, well, that's not the problem. That's the fruit of the problem. And sometimes it has to do with me, the way I'm thinking and the way I'm talking. The way I'm talking. I remember one time I'd been believing God for a healing in an area. And, I've, you know, over time I'm frustrated. I know nobody in here has ever had this, but I get frustrated. And I said, Lord, what's, how come this hasn't manifested? And, you know, I'm kind of, you know, complaining to God a little bit. And I'm waiting for him to answer me. And he answered me with a scripture. And the scripture was, if you had faith as a seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree. If you had faith as a seed, you might say unto this sycamine. What was he telling me? He was telling me, plant your seed, plant your seed, keep watering your seed, and your seed will produce. You can look at me, it's okay. Not me, but you know what I mean. Plant your seed, water your seed, the seed will grow, stay with the seed. Come on. Now the thing about planting a faith seed is, when the, when the tree starts growing up and starts branching out, how many of you know Jesus is the seed, he's the trunk, and he comes up, the branches start growing. You and I are a part of the branch. When the branch grows out, the branch begins to produce blossoms. It begins to you know, flourish. It begins to get into the process of producing the fruit. But there's something that has to happen before that fruit comes all the way to fruition. Yeah. It's called pruning. Because right. you and I as branches, sometimes we start producing things with the fruit of God that's not just the fruit of God. It's like the wheat and the tares in the field. Jesus says we got to wait here for a moment in time of harvest because if we try to pull the tares out now, it'll pull the wheat up with it. But once they come to harvest time, I'm going to go in and I'm going to jerk those tares out and burn them and then we're going to bring forth the fruit and the wheat and put it in the barn and the blessing will be there. Keep walking with God. Keep watering your seed. Keep believing Him for what you are believing Him for. But when you get to that place where He says, well, okay, we're finally at that point where we're going to see some fruit here. But this fruit over here, we don't want that. As a matter of fact, I can't produce what I want on your branch and produce that too. Come on, are you here? Yeah. My wife was telling me, and I know she won't mind me saying this. I think I've already said it publicly anyway. So if I was going to get in trouble, I would already got in trouble, I guess. She was saying how the Lord dealt with her about something and like that, and he was just pruning some things in her life. We all get pruned. And he, after he, she went through the process with him, he said, you just added 10 years to your own life. One of the fruits of God is long, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. I remember many years ago when I first got with God and answered the call and all this, I was driving out to a man's house that I was working with, and this man was a Christian man. He, he uh, had a family and was in the church I was in and all this kind of thing, and he had been seeing this other woman on the side. He had just, I found out that day that he walked away from his wife, went with this other woman, and so forth. And, of course, it upset me and grieved me because, you know, I knew what this was going to do to his family and all that. And I'm driving out to their house, and I heard in me, I didn't hear it out here like you talking to me or me talking to you. I heard in me a voice saying, I know it was the Holy Ghost, he said, that man just shortened his own life. He didn't let God prune his tree of whatever that was that caused him to do that. Ten years later, he had head-on collision, and he was dead in his 40s. Now, <laughs> come on, are you here? Oh, what are you trying to scare me? No, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to help you. Don't think you can, you can bear 
God's fruit and the enemy's fruit at the same time. It's not about God getting you. Remember the old stupid, well, some of you are not old enough to remember that song. Dumb song, God's going to get you for that. Remember that one, Steve? You're kind of old like me, aren't you? You remember that. It ain't about God getting you. It's about you. <laughs> it's <laughs> not that old yet. <laughs> 11 years difference. Thanks for pointing that out, Steve. I appreciate that. <laughs> Praise God. It ain't about God getting anybody. It's about you letting the devil in the door and him growing something in your life that's a poison fruit that's going to cause problems. We won't blame all this stuff on the devil and on God. God's saying, listen to me. Walk with me. Let me be your father. Like it says here, it says, attend to my words, incline your ear into my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Verse 21. Keep them in the midst of your heart. What I'm saying to you, what I'm showing you out of my word as you read it, embrace that, hang on to it, and stay with it. And when you as a human get your nose out of joint over something and you start doing things in the flesh and giving access to the devil, catch yourself and say, wait a minute. My father is chastening me, child training me, correcting me. That's what the word means. And I receive it because I need it. May I have another, please? Yes. Yes. It's good to get spanked by God. It's good to get spanked by God. Yes. Matter of fact, I'd rather get spanked by God than my dad. As if he really spanked me all that much. I didn't get it near as much as I needed it, let me tell you that. Or deserved it or whatever. But it's good to be corrected by your father. Over in Hebrews, I was going to get over there, but we don't have time today. Over in Hebrews, it says that he corrects us because of his love for us. It says our, our natural fathers corrected us, and we, we listened to it. He says, how much more are you the father of spirits? He's looking at your life long term, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. May I have another? <laughs> if need be. Now, I found in my life, he, he, he nurtures me a whole lot more than he corrects me. Amen. Amen. He doesn't get as upset about some things as I do. Now. But right on the other hand, like I, I told if you were here, I don't know, whenever I preach this, but I was driving with my sons and grandsons in a truck, and we got to talking about a situation and uh, we weren't really attacking anybody or a character assassination or anything, but we were just talking about what had happened. Got home, went to bed, got up the next morning, sat down, took my Bible to have my meeting with my father. Yeah. And the very first thing, a lot of times when I do that, there will either be a song in my heart that I'll minister to him or he'll tell me to turn, you know, prompt me to turn to us. So I'll have a thought come in my mind Psalm 118 or whatever. And that's the way it kind of goes with me. That's just the way he does with me. But that morning, first thing, I didn't hear you last night bless that person one time while you were talking about him. You didn't pray for him either, did you? See, what was I doing? I was agreeing with how, how they messed up and how messed up they still are. Because of the way they're acting. My father took issue with that. Matter of fact, this person's one of his children. And like I used to tell my boys when they'd get into it, you are not the father of this family. I am. So if you've got a problem with him, you come and talk to me, and Dad will help you straighten it out. Now, they didn't listen to that all the time. Especially Michael, he was sneaky. He knew how to communicate without words, <laughs> body language. And Mark would get mad and buy into it and usually throw something at him, and then Mark would get in trouble. <laughs> but our dad loves us. Our father loves us. If he does correct us, if he tells you, 
to not do something, do, do something. If he talks to you that way, it's not because he's trying to hurt your feelings. It's not because, you know, he's this big monster God that's going to look to smash people with his club or whatever. He's trying to keep the enemy out of your life. He wants you to walk on a pathway so that you can have a blessed life. Be a blessing and have blessed children and leave a blessing when you leave this earth. Amen. So decide, I'm going to listen to my Father's voice. I'm going to attend unto His words. As I read the Bible and the Holy Spirit speaks, the Father through the Spirit of God speaks to me and reveals the word to me, I'm receiving that. If I don't understand it, I'm going to ask Dad to explain it to me. Just like you might not know how to fix your bike when you were little. Dad, how do I do that? He'll show you. He'll talk to you. He'll help you. And he'll turn you into the father and the mother you need to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. We're so thankful that we have the security of knowing you as our father. God, forgive us for thinking we could do life on our own without you. Forgive us, Father. We ask you just to teach us and help us. Help us, Lord, to, even though we are, many of us in this room, we're adults, and, and there is responsibility that we need to take as an adult and, and so forth. At the same time, we also know, Lord, that you need to teach us and show us how to be the fathers and mothers we need to be. And, Lord, we need to hear you and your father's voice. I'm thankful you corrected me that morning. I don't want to be helping the devil out in somebody's life. I chose to repent of that. And, I cho- and right there, you know my heart. And I'm not saying this to brag on me. I'm saying it because I want people to know that we need to bless. We need to, to pray for people. Pray for the fullness of God's plan to come. Just because they've messed up up to this point doesn't mean they're going to stay messed up the rest of their life. Lord, help us. You told us even to bless our enemies. Glory to God. And if we can't bless our own friends and relatives, we're fooling ourselves if we think we're going to bless our enemies. So whatever this has meant to us today, any one of us in this room, Lord, if there's some pruning you need to do today, I say prune it, Lord. Prune it in my life. God, if there's just some nurturing that needs to be done here, some encouraging. You encouraged this earlier in this service. You said the children are going to reconnect. I thank you for what it says in Malachi, that the hearts of the fathers and the hearts of the children are are being brought together. And I know that's true in this day, that you're doing a work that's going to just amaze us as we watch you work in our families, in our nation, and in this world. We thank you for it, Father. And Lord, once again, I just pray for anyone here that uh, Father's Day might be a challenge for them. I pray you'll turn it around and cause it to be a blessing. And that all of us will look and and receive the example that you've given us. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Praise God. Is there anybody in here, before we dismiss today, that's never received Christ as your Savior? You've never prayed and asked him to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. You've never opened the uh, the heart of your door. I said it again. The door of your heart and asked him to come into your life. Given him your life. See? This is the thing people don't understand today. Jesus can't give you his life until you give him your life. You are the one that has that right to choose. And he is knocking on the door if he's not inside, saying, let me come in. We're going to have a spiritual feast together like none other. So if you're here today and you've never prayed to prayer like that and you want to before we leave, Just lift your hand, let me see your hand, and I'm going to agree with you. This congregation is going to agree with you. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to pick on you in any way. We just want to be able to agree with you in prayer uh, for you to receive the Lord. Is there anybody? Anyone at all? Okay. There was? Oh, someone online? I saw CJ raise his hand. I thought he was wanting to get saved there for a minute. (laughs) You're already saved. That's right. Somebody online? There is? Praise God. Is the name there? Did they give their name? Jackie. Okay, Jackie. We're here in this room right now. I don't know where you're at watching this, but we're going to pray right now with you, and Jesus is right there with you. As you open your heart, he's going to come into your life. You just invite him in. Just give him your life, 
and ask him to give you his life. So just repeat this with me as the congregation does. Just say, Lord, I come before you right now. Thank you for coming to this earth and dying on the cross for me. Thank you for rising from the dead for me. Thank you that you're seated in heaven for me. And so, Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I ask you to save me from my sins. I ask you to come into my life. I believe in my heart. And I say with my mouth that you are now my Lord and Savior. I welcome you into my heart. And I give my life to you. Teach me. Lead me. Guide me as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We agree. We rejoice. Amen. Jackie, wherever you're living, just try to find a good local church. Just pray and ask the Lord, Lord, lead me to the church that I need to go to. Don't make your own choice based on some kind of... uh, thing that you might like, you just open your heart to the Lord and ask him to connect you with the right place so that you can go there. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. Hey. Oh, she's in Madeira. I have a few suggestions, Jackie. <laughs> no, you just, you do what the Lord tells you to do. Of course, you're welcome to come and, and visit here and see if this is where God wants you to be, but uh, we rejoice with you, Jackie. Praise God. Amen. Amen. This place is a hospital. It's where people get healed and well. Let's stand. Praise the Lord. Karen just gave me a note saying that the camp kids will be back here around, right around noon. So if you want to hang around for 20 minutes or so, your kids will be back here dirty and exhausted. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If you, uh, if you need healing today, physical healing, just lift your hand up and hold it up high. Leave it up there in the sky. Hold it up for a minute. Look around, guys. Look around you. If you see somebody with their hand up, maybe they're in pain right now or having problems, just go to them and lay your hand on their shoulder. Come on, those of you that believe in laying on of hands, go find somebody. Back in the back. Praise God. Father, we lay hands on the sick right now in the name of Jesus. We release the healing virtue of God. We release the power of God. I command any foul spiritual interference, any demonic interference to go now in Jesus' name. I command you to loose the people of God in Jesus' name. And I command pain to go. We agree, all of us in this room, we command pain to go. We command healing to flow. We command that life. There's the anointing of God right there. The basitoro basata. Yes, the glory. The glory of God. (laughs) The glory of God coming into your being right now. Whether you feel anything or not, it's flowing into you right now. Receive it. Receive it in Jesus' name. And I command that problem that's been a problem for years, I say you stop today in Jesus' name. And I say that that's over with. Lord, I thank you for complete healing and deliverance in your goodness. You're a good father. You heal your children in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, have a great afternoon.